Hey everyone, thanks for learning to play games. My name is Lance, and in today's video I'm going to teach you how to play Zombicide Undead or Alive. This is one of the latest games in the Zombicide universe from Come On Games. It is a 1-6 to six player game that takes roughly 1-2 to two hours to play, and is a fully cooperative game where all the players are working together to complete whichever scenario they've chosen to go on. So in this video I'm going to take you through teaching you how to play starting with components, setup, the phases of the game, and end game conditions. As always, if you find my videos helpful, if you like what I do, please consider that like button and subscribing to my channel. It's one of the easiest ways you can support channels like mine so we continue to grow, be able to produce this content. If you want to get notified anytime I drop new videos, also give that notification bell a ring, and that'll let you know whenever I drop new stuff. Also, let me know in the comments down below what other kind of videos you'd like to see around this, or if you ever have any requests or suggestions on games you would like to see covered on the channel. I'd love to hear from you and start a conversation in the comments down below. So let's go ahead and head to the table, and I'll teach you how to play. There's one set of six-sided dice in the game, and each die is going to have the numbers one through six on it, with one being the zombie head with the cowboy hat, and the six being the dynamite. There are also four different mini decks that players are going to be using throughout the game. I want to take a closer look at each one of these. The first one is the starting weapons deck, and this is going to have the grayed border around the back of the card, and then again on the top of the front of the card. And then you'll also have the weapon's name, an image of that weapon, with ranged weapons, they are going to have the type of ammunition that they use at the top corner, which these are both bullet ammunition. And then if the weapon can be dual wielded, it'll have this symbol on the side. And I'll go into more detail about dual wielding during the attack step. At the bottom of the card, the first thing you're going to have is an icon that'll tell you if this is a melee weapon, which will have the little dagger, or a ranged weapon, which will either have the pistol or rifle icon. Next, you're going to have the four different stats for the weapon. The first one is the weapon's range, with zero being the same space as your target. Other weapons are going to list a range of spaces from, for example, with the pistol that is zero to one, and other weapons will have a required minimum number of spaces as well. With the rifle, you must target a space at least one space away, and it can go all the way up to two spaces. The next stat is the number of dice you're going to roll. For example, with the pan, I will roll one die when attacking. From there, then the next symbol with the little target is the number that you have to roll equal to or greater than to score a hit. So with the pan, I must roll a 5 or 6 on a die to score a hit. The final symbol is the amount of damage that that weapon does. And as you're going to see a little bit later in the video, each zombie is going to require a minimum amount of damage to kill. Finally, some weapons will generate noise, and this is going to show that they generate noise as well as the type of noise they generate. And I'll go into the difference, different types of noise a little bit later. Finally, at the bottom of the card is any special instructions with that weapon. The second deck of cards is the classic equipment deck, and this one's going to have the blue border on the back of the card. And then on the front side, each of these is going to have a blue border at the top of the card. Again, these are going to list the name of the card, and this deck is going to be comprised of all different types of cards, including different types of weapons and items that players will be able to use throughout the game. With item cards, again, they'll list the name of the item on the top, their image, and their effects when used and how to use them. For example, with this one, I can discard it to gain three action points. I can also, if I have a faithful character, which I'll cover that a little bit later, then I'm going to be able to use it for its different effect. And some items will also list that you can use them from your backpack. So if they can, they'll have that listed at the bottom of the card. And there's going to be all kinds of different items, including water or holy water, plenty of bullets, and dynamite among all the different weapons that you can use. The third deck of cards is the Bounty Weapon deck, and these are some of the more powerful weapons in the game. Each of these cards is going to have a red border around the back, along with the red border at the top of the card. On the back of each of these cards is going to show an illustration of the item, along with the item's name, and each of these items has two different ways of collecting it. The first way is meeting the requirements on the bottom of the card, and again I'll go over more of this a little bit later in the video. Other than that, on the front side of each of these is going to be the t name of the weapon, and then all the other information that I've already covered for weapons. The final deck of cards are the zombie cards, and these will be used during the zombie phase, and players will draw these and spawn new zombies into the different spawn points. There's going to be three different types of cards that players are going to be running into throughout this deck. The first are regular spawn cards, which are going to list the name of the zombies being spawned, and then going down the side of the card are the four different danger levels, blue, yellow, orange, and red. Based on whichever player has the highest danger level, that will be the level you're going to consult and spawn that many zombies of that type into that spawn point, which again, I'll go over more of that a little bit later in the video. 
Other cards, there's a few of the extra activation cards within this deck as well. And when these are drawn, they're going to list the type of zombie that is going to get an extra activation based again on the level. So if all the players are in blue level, then these cards will have no effect. But once players get into yellow, orange, and red, then all walkers, for example, will get an extra activation and will reactivate following the same steps that they previously did. The final type of cards are abomination cards, and these will spawn a new abomination onto the board, or if there's an existing one, it will get an extra activation, as well as it's going to be flipping the abomination spawn token over to its active side. And with these, you're also going to have a Abomination deck. In the core game, there's only one Abomination card, and this is your standard basic Abomination. But there will be expansions and additional add-ons or Kickstarter exclusives that you might have that will add additional Abomination cards to this particular deck that you'll shuffle up and draw when you spawn a new Abomination onto the board. Each one of these is going to list the name of that Abomination at the top and any special rules that ab that Abomination has at the bottom of the card. Each player is going to be controlling one or more survivors throughout the game, and each survivor is going to have its own card that is going to list the name of that survivor on the top, along with its class, which I'll cover next. Going down the side of the card are the different danger levels, and as players gain more adrenaline points, they are going to unlock higher danger levels with new abilities. Each survivor is going to start with their blue danger level unlocked, which will give them a starting ability, and these are going to be defined in the back of the rulebook. Then, as survivors gain adrenaline points, they'll unlock yellow, which is going to give them plus one action, and that is going to be true for all survivors. When they get into the orange level, there are two different possible abilities that that player can unlock. You'll choose one that'll be unlocked for the rest of the game. And then when they move into red, again, they're going to choose one of the three different options to gain for the rest of the game, and then they're going to mark that, as I'll show you a little bit later. Each survivor is going to have a spot for a special weapon, and this is going to list the type of weapon they can place in there. For example, with Meg here, she can place a gun or a pistol in this slot and hold it there and use it as if it was equipped in one of her hand slots. Each survivor is going to have a number of hit points that they can take before being eliminated, and it'll also list their class ability there. On the back of the survivor's card is going to list that class ability again and outline what kind of ability that is and how it is used. There are four different classes in Zombicide Undead or Live, the core game. Those are the Gunslinger, Faithful, Town Folk, and Brawler. And I'm going to cover these in more detail in a separate video if you want to know more and see some examples of how each one of the classes works. There are four different types of zombies you're going to be facing throughout the game. The first group are the walkers, and these are your basic zombies. There are five drip models representing them. Each walker requires one damage to kill and will get you one adrenaline point. Next are the brutes. These are the tough guys. They require two damage minimum to kill and will get you one adrenaline point. The runners are a, have a special rule that gives them two activations and each runner requires one damage to kill and will get you one adrenaline point. Finally, the Abomination. These are the big bads, and these require three damage points or dynamite to eliminate. And the base Abomination does not have any special rules, but other ones you can add to the game will have special rules. And it is worth five adrenaline points when you eliminate it. To start setup, the first thing you want to do is choose a scenario you want to play, and then you can gather the tiles and place them out based on that scenario. From there, then the next thing you want to do is gather up and place out all of the different objective tokens. And each tile is going to have a space for one of these tokens. And this scenario might have you using the different colored tokens as well. And again, that's going to be outlined on the scenario you've chosen to play. For example, with my scenario, I've chosen to play the second one, which is going to have me placing out the blue objective token on the side here. And this is basically just a timer that's going to move at the end of each round to show when the train is going to show up. Next, go ahead and gather up all the cards and separate them into their different decks. Shuffle each of those decks out and place that out where the players can reach. I'll have my spawn deck, the bounty deck, and the equipment deck. For this game, I'm also going to be using the Gatling gun and the wagon so I can place those cards out for the players to reference. And if you're just playing the base game, there is an Abomination card, but there is no special rules on it, so you don't need to place this one out. If you have chosen to add some of the expansions to the game, then you can gather up all of those and shuffle those Abomination cards up and place them out in their own pile. Next, based on the scenario again, you're going to place out a number of spawn points. 
go ahead and gather up a number of spawn white spawn points based on the number of tiles you're using as each tile will have one spawn point potentially that it'll be placed in so i'm going to go ahead and place those off to the side as you're not going to place those out at the beginning of the mission Next, you can go ahead and place out the number one spawn point in its position, and then the mobile spawn points will go into theirs, again outlined on the scenario guide, and then the abomination spawn point will go out on its inactive side, which is the side with the white X on it, to start the game. Again, unless the scenario dictates otherwise. Again, this scenario is going to use the wagon, so I'm going to place that out, and it will also have the Gatling gun. Before getting into player setup, there's two important things I want to go over. First, in Zombieside Undead or Live, as you saw during the component coverage, there is a new class system included in this one. And based on the scenario you've chosen to play, some scenarios will restrict which classes are allowed to be used. So make sure you're paying attention to the scenario you've chosen to play when choosing which survivors you'd like to play as. Next, in the game, it is recommended to play with six survivors during with these scenarios. You can choose to play with less, especially if you like to play a harder difficulty game, as having less survivors means you have less actions to work with when dealing with zombies. You can also choose to include companions, which will basically balance that out a little bit, which I'm going to cover later on in the video. For this video, I'm only going to be using four survivors, as I'm not playing through the whole game, it's just simply to teach you how to play. So from there, let's go ahead and head into player setup. For a player setup, each player is going to choose one or more survivors they'd like to play and will receive a dashboard for each survivor they've chosen to play. Then they're going to place their survivor's card in its slot and gain the miniature for that survivor. The next, they're going to choose a color and they'll gain the colored base for that and five of the dynamite tokens for that. And then these are going to be placed, three of them in, this, in the top slots here. One of them will be placed on your blue starting ability and then one will mark your health. So whatever your top health is, you'll go ahead and mark that. Remember with the brawler classes, they will start with three health. Next, each survivor is going to choose a favorite weapon from the starting gray weapons and place it in that slot there. From there, then each survivor has a, a space for their backpack items, which will hold up to three backpack items. They'll have their two hand slot spaces and then their adrenaline track at the bottom that is going to mark their danger level with them being blue, yellow, orange, and then finally red at the very end. As survivors gain adrenaline points, they're going to move this gauge up, and then once they reach the first space of the next color, they're going to unlock that ability, and they'll place one of their dynamite tokens in that slot, gaining that ability. Once you've completed player setup, choose one player to be the starting player. For my game, I'm gonna go ahead and have Meg be the starting player. Then each player can place their miniature out on the starting space, which is going to again be outlined in your scenario. There won't be a physical token for that. Then you also place out the bang token based on the scenario in its space, and then you're ready to begin the game. Zombieside Under Alive is played over an undefined number of rounds. During each round is broken down into three phases the players are going to play in order. These are the player phase, zombie phase, and end phase. And this is going to continue going round after round until the players collectively complete all of the objectives for the scenario they've chosen to play, winning that scenario, or if at any time the players meet one of the three different fail conditions then the game is going to immediately end and the players are going to lose. These fail conditions are if any survivor or companion is eliminated, the game will end. If, for whatever reason, the players cannot complete any of the remaining objectives for the mission, the, the game is going to end, or if at any time a seventh spawn point becomes active, the players will immediately lose the game. Now, I do want to point out one important thing with this, that I do like to modify our house rule, which is that first uh, fail condition with any survivor or our companion being eliminated, the game is going to end. With this one, I do modify this sometimes based on who I'm playing with. I'm playing with new players that I'm introducing this to, or younger players, I might eliminate this rule, or sometimes it's just fun to continue playing as the more survivors that get eliminated, the, the more difficult that game is going to be as you have less actions to deal with the, the zombies that are coming down on you. And sometimes it's just fun to see how far the players can get as survivors go down, making that ultimate sacrifice for the greater good of the party and seeing if the remaining survivors can make it out of that mission alive. But it's totally up to you how you want to play. And as the rules state, if any companion or survivor gets eliminated, 
then the game is going to end. So from here, let's go ahead and move into the game, starting with that very first phase in each round, which is the player phase. Now, there's a couple important concepts that I want to go over before getting into the game itself. The first is zones. So you're going to be playing on your scenario based on whichever one you've chosen on a number of different game boards. And these boards are going to be put together and then they're going to create different zones. And there's two different types of zones. You'll have building zones and street zones. With the street zones, they are going to be made up and separated by these lines. And as you connect tiles, those will make one zone. So for example, with this space here, this is considered one zone that is made up of the two different tiles. This is another zone, and these are separated by these wooden planks going across the sections. With the middle zone here, this is made up of four different ends to make one zone in the middle there. So that will incorporate all four of those. From there, within buildings, they are made up a number of building zones, and these are going to be separated by the walls that will have little doorways in them. So, for example, with this one, this is made up of two separate rooms in this building, or two building zones. With this one over here, we have the balcony, which is a separate zone, which has its own special rules, which I'll cover in a little bit. And then it has three different building zones in it that are connected by these doorways. Now, one interesting fact is when you start adding the train or the tile, or the uh, railroad tiles, these are going to create zones themselves. So, for example, now with these two in there, this is going to be considered one zone connecting all three of these pieces in there. This, again, is one zone, and you'll see that it's separated and added in here with these white colored railroad ties. And then this one is made up of all of these spaces here, so that is considered one zone there. Now, when the train starts coming out, so if we flip these over, and we'll go ahead and reverse these around, that is going to separate these zones. For example, with the locomotive here, this is going to separate these zones and make this a single space and that a single space. This is not considered one zone, and players will not be able to move across here as the train is going to block that. And it'll have its own little zones within it for the railroad cars. And one other example of this, let's go ahead and flip this one back over. So with this now, in this middle zone, this is considered one zone that is connected by these five different sections here. But this section is not part of that zone. During this phase, each player is going to get to take a turn. Starting with the first player and then proceeding clockwise around the board with each player getting to take a turn in order. During a player's turn, that player will get three action points that they can spend to do a variety of different actions. As the game progresses, players will unlock new abilities that might grant them free actions or additional actions that they will get to spend for the remainder of the game. For example, when a player moves into the yellow danger level, that player will unlock an additional action point for the remainder of the game. So at that point moving forward, that player will have four action points to spend. So from here, let's move into the player phase and start by covering all the different actions that players can take. A move action allows a survivor to move from their zone to an adjacent zone that is connected by an edge. No diagonal movement is allowed, only orthogonal movement. So looking at a couple of examples of this, with Meg here, I can move from her zone to a connected zone, so this next street zone, as it shares an edge with the previous street zone. I cannot move into a building zone unless there is an opening there, so Meg could not move into either one of these building zones right now as there is not an opening on either side. So as an action, she could spend to move into this zone here. Now, if she wants to do another move action, she can move from this zone here into this zone or into this building zone here. So let's go ahead and say that I want to move here. From there, now if, that she's in a building, if she wishes to do a move action, she has a number of choices. She can move in from her room and back into the street zone, up the staircase onto the balcony, into this room as there's an opening here, or into this room as there's an opening here into that room. Now, one important thing with movement is if, for example, Meg was into this space or Meg was in this space here, and there are zombies in there. If you wish to move out of a space with zombies, it's going to cost you one additional action per zombie that's in that space. So if she wished to move from that space into this space here, it would cost her one move action to move from here to here, plus an additional move action to from with each zombie in there. So it would cost her three actions to move from this zone into this zone. And the one other important thing with this is if a survivor has an ability that allows them to move multiple zones per move action, if during that they move into a zone with zombies, they must stop immediately. So for example, let's say that Meg has a ability that allows her to move two zones per move action. If she wished to move into this zone, she would stop because there are zombies in that zone. Now, if they were in this zone, then she could move into that zone as the one action.
One important note with moving into buildings for the first time, with Zombieside Undead or Live, you're not going to spawn zombies in the individual rooms like you did in past editions by opening a door. In Zombieside Undead or Live, some of the buildings are going to have corpse piles in them. And when the first survivor moves into one of the zones in that building for the first time, then you're going to place a corpse token at spawn point in that room. And then from that point on, you'll spawn zombies in that area until that token has been deactivated. Now, for the rest of the game, once a token has been deactivated, it will not be reactivated unless the mission you're playing says otherwise. And this is only going to happen when the first survivor moves into that building. After that point, if that survivor moves out and somebody else moves in, that is not going to generate another token to be placed in there. A search action can only be done in a building in a room that contains no zombies. So with Meg being in this room right now that has no zombies, she can perform a search action. When doing so, she's going to draw the top card of the search deck, and then she can add it to her inventory. She can also freely rearrange her inventory after completing a search action. So with her drawing the Remington, she might want to dual wield these and displace the machete in her backpack instead, equipping those two Remingtons so that she can dual wield them. Now there's a couple important notes with this. First, a survivor is only allowed to perform one search action during their turn. The one exception to that is if they are the townfolk class, then they are allowed to perform additional search actions during their turn per action they spend to search. And survivors may discard cards from their inventory to make room for new cards at any time for free. The reorganize and trade action will allow you to first rearrange your inventory in any way you want. And if you are in the same space as another survivor, you can choose one of those survivors to trade with. And this trade can be equal or you can simply give them items however you want to do it. As this is a fully cooperative game, you're working together. So it is beneficial to share items with other players that are in need of them. And then that survivor can also rearrange their inventory for free. So let's look at an example of this. Let's go ahead and say that Meg, she has the machete and she's in the same space as Carl who is a brawler and really benefits from melee weapons and he happens to have a machete in his backpack that he doesn't have equipped right now. So he would love to have another machete that he can do wield and since she is in the same space as him if she initiates a reorganize and trade action she can go ahead and give her machete to Carl and then he can rearrange his inventory for free adding the other machete into his hands. Likewise, once Meg is completed with that, she can also reor or reorganize her inventory. So maybe she wants to have the twin barrel equipped instead of just the Remington. And again, the important thing with this is you're only allowed to trade with one other survivor in your space. So even though Thomas was in here, he might have had items or wished to gain things from them as well. But he, you can only trade with one other survivor per action. So she could initiate another action to trade with Thomas if she wanted to. The take or activate objective token action is going to allow you to interact with something on your space. Now this is going to be dependent upon the mission, but most of the time it's going to be taking objective tokens. And each mission is going to outline what happens when you do. With most of the time, you will get five adrenaline points, and you're also going to get the to draw the top card of the bounty deck and add it to your area right away. Some missions are also going to have you flipping it over, looking for a particular color on the back side, in which case then that will activate something, again, that is going to be outlined in that mission. The make noise action allows you to place the noise token in your space on the bang side. Now this action cannot be taken if the boom side is already out on the board somewhere. The final type of action you can perform is a combat action, and this is broken down into two different types of combat, melee combat and ranged combat. So the first one I want to look at is melee combat, as this is going to lay down the fundamentals of combat, and then you're going to add a couple of additional rules for ranged combat. So in this example, I'm going to go ahead and use Carl, and he has a couple of different weapons equipped, so he must choose one weapon that he has equipped that is a melee weapon, which has the little dagger in the bottom corner. Then, if he has multiple weapons of the same name, he can dual wield those weapons if they have the dual wield symbol. So if I had a pair of tomahawks equipped, both of them have the dual wield symbol and they have the same name, so I could dual wield those weapons, which I'll cover in a little bit. So from there, then he's going to go ahead and select the tomahawk to attack with. Whichever weapon you choose, you must be within range. With all Mayweather weapons, they have a range of zero, which means you must be in the same space as your enemy in order to perform the melee attack. From there, then I'm going to gather up the number of dice that I need for the weapon. So this one's going to grant me two dice. I'm going to go ahead and roll these, and for each die that rolls equal to or greater than the target value, I'm going to score a hit. 
and I scored one as I have a five and a two. So one of those is a success. From there, then I'm gonna choose one of the enemies to eliminate. With a melee weapon, I get to choose the enemy instead of having to follow a priority as you're going to see in the ranged combat. Now, the weapon that I have equipped must deal the amount of damage in order to defeat that enemy. So I cannot choose the Brute in this example as my weapon only does one damage and the Brute requires two damage to kill. But I could choose either one of the walkers or the runner to kill in this example. And as the runner is the most threatening of the enemies, I'm gonna go ahead and eliminate him and remove him from the board. Each enemy that I eliminate is also going to grant me an adrenaline point. So I'm gonna get one adrenaline point for eliminating that zombie. Let's go ahead and say instead though, that I rolled two successes. So I get to choose two of the enemies in this example to eliminate. So let's go ahead and take another walker. And in that situation, then I would move into the yellow danger level, which immediately allows me to gain the ability on there, which yellow is always gonna grant me one additional action, which I can use immediately. So if this was my third and final action and I unlocked that, now I have a new action or a new action that I can use right away to take another action with. So I could do another melee attack. Now I do want to point out with Carl, he does have a, his starting ability, which is plus one damage to melee. So with Carl, he actually would bump this weapon's damage up by one point. So the Tomahawk would do two points of damage, in which case he could actually eliminate Brutes in this example. Or if he had a two point weapon, such as the Machete here, he could actually do three points of damage, which could kill an Abomination. So Carl is a very powerful character if he's got the right equipment. So now the last thing I wanna cover is the dual wield weapons. With this example, I'm gonna have the pair of Tomahawks, and the only difference with this is that I get to use both of them in my melee attack, so I'm going to add the dice together for both of the weapons, so I would actually get to roll four dice for this attack. The next thing I wanna cover is line of sight. So with that, I went ahead and put out a couple of the different survivors and some zombies to go through this example. So first off, let's go through street zones again. So now that you're familiar with what those are, let's take a look at Thomas here. So Thomas can see in a straight line as far down as the street goes all the way to the board edge. So I can see any one or any of these zones along that path. And I can also see down these two zones down this street. Now when in a street zone, you can see into one space into a building zone. So with Thomas, I can see this zone here as it is the first space in the building, which allows me to, I can also see this walker in here. Now, if Thomas was here, I could not see Meg as she is in the second room in that building. I can only see into this space here in the building. Now, likewise, if a survivor is in a building, they can only see into the next space of that building, unless they are a townsfolk, which have the special rule that they can see any number of spaces in a building. So they treat buildings just like the street zones where they can see as far as they're able to in a straight line. So the other important thing with that is, let's go ahead and say that Meg was here. As with she's in here, I cannot see this zombie in here, but if she was here, I can see out into the street and that'll extend as far as the street goes as well into the first space of a building. So she could see in here. Let's say for this example that there was a doorway here leading out into the street zone. I could then see this zombie here and I would extend all the way into this first space of the building here. So I could see into there in that example. The final thing I wanna talk about are balconies. So these are a special new rule within this game. And with balconies, they are considered to be in all the street zones that they straddle. And you can see down all of those street zones. So with Trixie here, I can see down both of these street zones here and all of these street zones here. I'm also able to see balconies that are in those street zones. So I could see into this balcony here. Now, you still need a weapon that has the range to reach your targets, even though you can technically see them. But let's say, for example, with this zombie here, she is two zones away. So if she had a rifle that, was, that had a um, range of two, she could target this zombie here, or this one would be considered one space away. Now, with the balconies, they can see into buildings, but only that first room that the staircase connects to them as they are in elevated position. So with Trixie, she is a townsfolk, which normally allows her to see any number of spaces in a building in a straight line. With this situation, she can only see into this zone, even though normally she would be able to see into these zones. The balcony takes that special rule out for those situations. 
The one other important thing I point out is with, with building zones here, let's go ahead and say that Thomas was in this building zone. He would be able to see this zombie here in this building zone, even though it looks like he wouldn't be able to, as this is one building zone. So technically he is anywhere within here. So he basically would line up there and be able to shoot into that zone. The other type of combat action you can perform is a ranged combat action. With this example, I'm going to be using Meg, and with this one, just like with the melee attacks, you can choose one of the weapons you have equipped that is a ranged weapon, which is any weapon that has the little pistol or rifle icon in the bottom corner. With Meg, she has the old timer equipped, so I'm gonna go ahead and use that weapon. Next, you're going to choose a zone which you wish to target with, that is within your weapon's range. So with the old timer, it has a range of zero to one. So it can be the zone that you're in or up to one zone away, which can be this zone here, this zone here, or this zone here. Next, with that, when you're targeting a zone, you're targeting the entire zone and not individual zombies within it which is important as ranged attacks follow a targeting priority. As you can see on this chart, you're always going to target brutes and abominations first and the targeting priority. If both of them are present in the same zone, then you get to choose which one is hit. After that comes walkers and finally runners, which means if a brute is in a zone, the brute has to be eliminated first before any of the other enemies can be targeted. So in this example with Meg here, her old timer only does one damage. So if she uses it in the zone that she's in, it'll hit the brute and the brute requires two damage to eliminate. So the old timer cannot eliminate the brute. And so none of the zombies in the zone can be hit. If the brute was not in the zone, then it would go to the uh, walker first that would be eliminated. Once that is eliminated, then finally the runner could be eliminated. So in this example, I'm gonna go ahead and target this zone instead, as I am able to target zones outside of my zone if my weapon has range, even if I have enemies in my zone. So I'm gonna go ahead and target this zone with the walker as I can actually eliminate that enemy. Next, I'm gonna gather up the number of dice as shown on the weapon, just like before, and then I'm gonna go ahead and roll, and if I can get equal to or greater than the target value, then I score a hit. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that I rolled a five, which is equal to my target value, so I have eliminated this walker. So first off, before eliminating him, my weapon does generate noise, so I'm going to place the noise token in there with the bang side up as it shows. Then the walker will be eliminated, and I'm going to gain one experience point per enemy that I eliminated, except for the abomination which grants more. So from there, that is the conclusion of my action, and then I could take another action if I had any actions remaining. Now there are a couple of other important notes with this. First off, let's talk about if there, if you're targeting a zone that has other survivors in it. In this situation, let's go ahead and say that I wish to target this zone and the brute was not in there. If I roll a miss when shooting, it's going to hit one of the survivors in that zone that I'm targeting. And again, it'll be up to the players to choose which survivor that's hit. Now you cannot hit yourself. So if you're in, the, if you target a zone that you're in, they, you are not going to hit yourself on misses. But if other survivors are in there, then it will hit them. So in this example, I would actually hit Carl and Carl would take a wound in this situation. But if I rolled a success, again, then the walker would be the next one to go in targeting priority. The one other important note with this is that some ranged weapons cannot target the space that the survivor is in, such as the Henry Repeater here has a range of one to three spaces. So I could not target the zone that I'm in, I must target at least a zone that is one zone away from me. Unfortunately with this weapon, that would have been really helpful in this situation as it does two damage and could potentially eliminate the brute if I score a successful hit. Now that I've gone through all the different types of actions you can perform during your turn, let's put this all together and I'll take you through a player phase. So with this, I'm going to go ahead and start off with Meg as she is the first player. And I think with her, I want to move the wagon forward as I have all three of these spawn points kind of converging and that Gatling gun would be super helpful dealing with that. So I'm going to spend all three of her actions during her turn to move the wagon forward one space. From there, that will end her turn, and I'm going to move over to Thomas to go next. So with Thomas, I'm going to spend his first action to move into this building. And the first time you move into a building, you have to drop a building spawn point in there on the active side. And then as his second action, I'm going to go ahead and do a search. And I found a machete, so I'm going to go ahead and equip that. And then as his final action, I think I'm going to go ahead and use his special ability to place his Volde Retro token in that space, hopefully to deal with something if we get a zombie that might be strength two or something like that. That'll help us as that adds plus one strength to his combat damage. 
And from there, then it's going to move on to Carl to go next. So Carl's going to go ahead and move in as his first action. His second action, he's going to grab that objective token. Now, in certain games, you'll flip it over, and if they're if you're using colored tokens, that might have a different effect. This one simply is just going to remove it, and I'm going to get five adrenaline points for that. I also receive a bounty weapon for that, so I'm going to go ahead and grab that. And I have the Manadu Wrath, and this one is a really nice melee weapon. As his final action, I'm going to go ahead and do a search as well, hopefully finding something good. And I found a tomahawk, so I'm going to go ahead and place that in his favored section. As the pan pretty much is going to be useless at this point, I'm simply going to discard it. That will finish off his turn. And then our final uh, survivor is Trixie, so she's going to move in as well. And she's going to go ahead and do a search, and she finds the show field. So I'm going to go ahead and equip that. And then she, since she is a townsperson, she can also do multiple searches during her turn, as long as she has action to spend. So I'm going to go ahead and do her final action and search again. I found a knife, so this is going to add a plus one to another equipped melee weapon. So that's good. Unfortunately, she doesn't have any other melee weapons, so she may want to trade that off at a later point. At this point, all of the survivors have gone, so that is the end of the survivor phase, and we're ready to move into the zombie phase. Once all the survivors have activated, you're ready to move into the second phase in the round, which is the zombie phase. During this phase, there are two steps that are going to be done in order, the zombie activation, and then the spawn step. And I'm going to take you through each one of these in more detail to explain how they all work. So with this, let's go ahead and start with the zombie activation. And during this step, I went ahead and added some zombies to the board, as normally at the beginning of the game, you're not going to have any zombies out there. And so I wanted to make sure that I showed you a good example of how this works. So during this step, each one of the zombies is going to activate on the board, and based on where they are, and if they share the same space as a survivor, will dictate what kind of action they're going to perform, which is either going to be attacking a survivor in the same space as them, or if they are not in the same space as a survivor, then they're going to move one space towards either the closest visible survivor or the noise token. So from here, let's move into that. So we are, you can start in any way you want to. It is It does recommend to start with these zombies that are in the same space as survivors, but it's up to you as the players as you're going to be handling this activation. So starting over here, I have two walkers in the same space as Thomas, Carl, and Trixie. So each one of them is going to attack and it'll be up to the players to decide how they want to divide these attacks up. So you're going to have each zombie do one damage. So I have a total of two damage coming to the three survivors in there. Now I could have one of the survivors take all of the damage, such as Carl, who has an extra hit point. But if I chose Trixie or Thomas, that would eliminate them as they only can take two points of damage and then that would end the game. Or I can divide it up. Say, let's uh, say that Thomas takes one and let's take one with Carl. So from there, then that is the end of their activation. And then moving on to the other zombies. The rest of the zombies are not sharing the same space with a survivor, so they're simply going to move towards the closest survivor, either the one that they can see or the, the noise token, whether it is the bang or boom. So with our zombies up here, let's go ahead and start with them. The walker is going to move one space forward as she can see Meg over here. From there, then I do have a walk or a runner here, and runners will get two activations. With the rules, it is recommended to separate these into two separate activations. So you'll go through and do all your activations for the first set, and then you'll go back through and reactivate each one of the runners out there. So that's how I'm going to do this. But as you get familiar with the game, you can take care of this all in one easy step. So then this runner is going to move one space forward, as again, he can see Meg. With this runner here, he cannot see any survivors, so he's going to simply move towards the bang token. And you're always going to take the shortest path possible. If there are multiple paths of equal distance, then the players get to choose. And if there's a group of zombies that are in that and there's equal paths, then they're going to split as evenly as possible between the two paths. So then this runner is going to move one space forward. And then I do have a walker and a brute in here in the building. Again, they cannot see Meg as they are within the building more than one space away from her. So they cannot see her. So they're simply going to move forward one space towards that bang token. And now they can see her. So during their next activation, instead of moving again, there is two equal paths to the bang token. But now that they can see a survivor, they're going to move towards her. 
But if, say, she wasn't there and they were still trying to get to the bank token, equal paths, they would split and each one would take a different route. All right, so that would complete the activation or the first activation. Then again, we're going to go into the second activation just for the runners. So then each runner would again activate and move. Now, again, if a runner is in the same space, let's go ahead and say that this runner was here to begin at the beginning of the activation step. During their, this runner's first activation, he would move in with Meg. And then during his second activation, he would get to attack her. Likewise, if a runner is moving during the first activation with this runner up here, if he moved here and then there's a survivor here now, he can see that survivor. And so in this situation, he would move towards that survivor during his second activation. So those are important things to point out. At this point, that has we have activated all of the different zombies out on the board. And so the activation step has come to an end. And we're going to move into the second step of the zombie phase, which is the spawn step. Before moving on to the second step in the zombie phase, I do want to talk about spawn points as there are four different types of spawn points you're going to be running into in each of your games. The first one is the yellow spawn point, which is the starting spawn point. Normally, unless the mission says otherwise, this spawn point cannot be moved or destroyed and is always going to be the first spawn point you're going to spawn new zombies at during the spawn step, as you're going to see in a little bit. The next one is the mobile spawn points. With these spawn points, unless the mission again says otherwise, a survivor that has holy water can throw it on these spawn points to move them from their place to the starting spawn zone. And then at that point, moving forward during the spawn step, you're always going to spawn the starting spawn zone first and then followed by any mobile spawn zones there. The next one you're going to run into is the Abomination spawn uh, point. With this one, when an Abomination is out on the board, this will become active and you'll have to resolve spawns on that spawn point until the, the Abomination has been eliminated, at which point then this is going to immediately be flipped back over to its inactive side. Now with the zombie abom or the Abomination spawn point, you can also use Holy Water on that to move it to the starting spawn point zone, unless again the mission says otherwise. The final spawn point is the corpse pile spawn point. The first time a survivor moves into a new building that has a corpse pile in it, you're going to place a corpse pile spawn point on there. Then during the game, if a survivor is able to throw holy water on it, you're going to flip it over to its inactive side, and this will remain inactive for the rest of the game, again, unless the mission says otherwise. Now, one important mo note with the corpse pile tokens is if you have a building that consists of multiple tiles that have multiple corpse pile spawn zones in them or uh, uh, zones in them, you are only and you move into that building, only the tile that you move into this building is going to have a spawn token play or spawn corpse pile tokens placed on it. So if both of these buildings were placed together, making one big building, and this the survivor moved into this tile, only this tile would have the spawn the corpse pile token placed on it and not this one here until one of the survivors moved onto one of the zones of that building. Then that would also place the other spawn zone. And again, one important note with this is if there are ever seven active spawn points, the game is over and the players lose immediately. During the spawn step, the first thing you're going to do is look at all of the different survivors' danger levels. And whichever survivor has the highest danger level, that is going to be the danger level you'll resolve each one of the spawn cards at. So right now, all of our survivors are in blue, but if Carl had made it into yellow, then we would resolve all spawn cards at the yellow danger level, even though the rest of the survivors are at blue. And you're always going to start with the spawn point with the number one on it. And then from there, you'll proceed in a clockwise manner around the board, drawing and resolving one spawn card per spawn point on the board that is active. If you have an area that has multiple spawn points, again, you're always going to start with the one, and then you'll work your way down through the rest of the spawn points. So starting at the top here, let's go ahead and draw a card and see what we have. So we have walkers, and then again, based on the danger level, we'll dictate how many walkers we spawn. Right now we are on the blue danger level, so we're going to spawn two walkers in that spawn point. From there then, again, we'll proceed clockwise to the next spawn point over here, drawing another card. So this one is going to be runners, and there's going to be four of them in there at blue. That is horrible. So we'll drop four in that space. 
Then we'll continue on and we have a new spawn point here that we just triggered. So this one is going to have us drawing four walkers and placing them in there. Okay, onto this orange spawn point over here. We have an abomination, oh no. So the abomination is gonna drop down and anytime a abomination comes onto the board, their spawn point is going to be flipped over and become active. And if you have not passed it yet, when you're resolving spawns, then you're going to have to resolve it during this step. And with that being the next one, we will have to resolve it. Otherwise, we would have had completed our spawn step. So during this, we have to resolve this last one here and it's another group of two walkers. So we'll place two more walkers in that spawn point. Now there's one other kind of spawn card in there, which are going to be the extra activation cards. So when these come up, based on the danger level, if you're in blue, then nothing is going to happen and you dodged a little bit of a bullet. Otherwise, the other danger levels will activate all of the zombies of that type on the board. So with this one here, we would have activated all of the walkers on the board and they would have gone through another activation step. Again, if they are sharing the same space, then they would attack. Otherwise, they would move. And then this deck is going to have a lot more abominations in it. So if an abomination is out already on the board and you draw another abomination card, then you're going to activate the abomination on the board and it's going to immediately take another activation. With spawning, there's one other important thing I want to point out. Running out of miniatures. So what happens in that situation? So Undead or Alive has a different take on this. If you run out of zombies of a particular type, so let's go ahead and say that we're spawning four walkers in a spawn point, but we only have two left. We're going to place the remaining walkers that we have on that spawn point, and then we're going to immediately activate the abomination. In past games, you would activate all the zombies of that type. So in this one, the abomination is going to activate. And, and that's going to happen every single time you have to play zombies that you are out of. So if you're not careful, you're going to have that abomination rampaging throughout the board, ending the game rather quickly. Once you've resolved all of the zombie spawn points, the zombie phase is going to come to an end, and you're ready to move into the final phase in the round, which is the end phase. During this phase, there's only a couple of steps that are going to be handled in order, and then it'll start all over again with the player phase. So during this phase, the first step is resolving the bang token. If the bang token is on its boom side, you're going to flip it back over to its bang side and leave it where it is. If it is already on its bang side, you're going to move it to the zone that has the most survivors. And if there's a tie, then the players get to choose which zone they're going to move it to. In my example, the most survivors are in this building zone here, so I'm simply going to move the bang token into that room with those survivors. From there, then the final step is going to move, be moving the first player token to the next player in clockwise order. So with Meg having it during this round, she's going to pass it over to Thomas to be the first player during the next round. Now I do want to point out that you make sure that you reference your mission that you're playing as each mission is also going to have potential changes to one or more of these phases. For example, with mission two, I do have this blue token out here, which is a timer more or less for when the, the train is going to arrive. And it states in mission two that during the end phase, I'm going to move this token one space forward along the railroad. And if the token moves off, then the train is going to arrive. And then I would handle that, which I'm going to cover a little bit later in the video. So at this point, this round or this phase has come to an end and we're ready to move into a new round, starting with the player phase and Thomas to be the first player. So now that I covered the different phases in a round, I do want to cover some additional rules with Zombieside Undead or Alive. The first one are the trains, as this game is going to have two different types of trains. You'll have immobile trains, which are simply going to be additional pieces on the board, and they're not going to be moved around, so you'll just simply follow the setup instructions on your mission. And then other missions are going to have mobile trains, which means that they're going to show up at certain points throughout the game, and they're actually going to move along the track, as you're going to see in a minute. So when they arrive, there's a couple of different steps that are going to be handled in order, and I'm going to take you through each one of these. So first off, let's go ahead and talk about Mission 2. So Mission 2, when the blue token moves off, that's going to signify that the train has arrived. When this happens, you're going to follow a couple of different steps. First off, 10V is going to be the locomotive tile, and so you're going to flip that over, signifying that the train has showed up. And any zombies that are on any of the spaces 
of that tile are going to be eliminated, including abominations. So the abomination would be eliminated, and all three of these zombies, as this is considered one space, are also going to be eliminated and removed from the board. Now, survivors are not going to receive any adrenaline points for those zombies that have been eliminated. Also, if there are any mobile spawn points, those are also going to be immediately moved to the starting spawn points area or zone. Then any survivors that are on those zones are going to get to move for free into one of the adjacent zones. For example, with these, since these were considered one zone before, these survivors that were on those zones can choose either to be on one side of the street or other, which again, then this is going to be separated into two separate zones. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then finally, the locomotive is a very loud thing on the board. So you're going to immediately flip over the token, the bang token to the boom side and place it on the locomotive. Now, the locomotive is an impassable piece of train, so you are not allowed to move through it. So at this point, this has been separated into a U-shaped form for that space at this point, And you will not be able to cross over that locomotive. And then at the end of each player phase, at this point, the locomotive will move to the next space. Again, with this, it would eliminate any zombies on any of those spaces and move that spawn point, as well as taking that boom token with it when it moves. So let's look at another quick example of that. So this would be moved up here. These guys would be eliminated. And then this one would be flipped over to show that the car has been following suit with it. And then likewise, at the end of the next player phase, then the locomotive is going to leave the board and then the train cars are going to move along the track as well, slowly moving that train off the board permanently. There are also two different machine actions I wanna go into detail on. Now these are going to be dependent upon if the machine is used in the mission you've selected to play, which will be outlined in that mission's description. The first is the wagon, and there's a couple of different things you can do with this. First, if you are in the wagon zone but not inside the wagon, you can choose to move the wagon by spending three action points. This will allow you to move the wagon yourself and anything that's in it from your zone to an adjacent zone following all the normal movement rules. With one exception, you are not allowed to use any special abilities that your survivor has. For example, if you have an ability that allows your survivor to move two zones per move action, you will not be able to move that, use that to move the wagon. The other type of action is getting in and out of the wagon. This is going to cost you one movement point and allow you to move in from your zone that is sharing the zone with the wagon into the wagon zone, or likewise going back out of the wagon. Now you do have to follow all the normal movement rules such as penalties for zombies and whatnot. If you end your turn in the zone that contains the wagon, you may get into the wagon for free. So for example, if Meg moved into this space as her last action, at the end of her turn, she could choose to move into the wagon for free. And one other important note with this, zombies are never going to get into the wagon, but may attack survivors that are standing in it. So even with Meg being in here, she is not protected. Those zombies that are in that zone would still be able to attack her. The other type of machine you're going to run into is the Gatling Gun. And this is, again, going to provide you with two different types of actions. Like the wagon, you can move the Gatling Gun unless it is on the wagon, in which case then you'll have to move the wagon. With the Gatling Gun, again, you have to spend three action points to move it from your space to an adjacent space. You're going to follow all the normal movement rules. And again, you will not be able to use any of your skills or abilities to benefit from that. And then the other type of action with the Gatling Gun is an attack action. This one's going to cost you one action point, and then you're going to use the Gatling Gun's stat card. As you can see here, this one has a range of one to three spaces. It's going to roll three dice. Every die that rolls a four better is going to score a hit. It'll do two damage, and it's going to cause the boom noise to be placed on there. It also has the special rule Escalation, which means that every attack action you make after the first one is going to add an additional die as the Gatling Gun warms up. Now, one important note with the Gatling Gun is that it will not benefit from any skills that you have. So if you have any skills that are going to add additional dice or change the results to your targets or your target number or anything like that, you will not benefit from them. You will have to use the Gatling Gun as its own. So looking at an example of this, let's go ahead and say that we want to target this space. It is one space away. I'm going to go ahead and roll my dice just like a shoot action. And for every four or higher, I'm going to score a hit. 
Again, this is going to be distributed just like the shooting action, so the Brute would be targeted first, and the Gatling gun, gun does two damage, so it will eliminate the Brute, and I will gain one Adrenaline Point for that. And then because of that, I'm also going to place the Boom token in that space. Then as my second action, I'm going to go ahead and shoot again into this space with the zombies, and this time I get to roll an additional die. So again, I will go ahead and roll, and I got two successes this time, so both of these zombies are eliminated, and I'll gain two adrenaline points. My final action, let's go ahead and say that I wanted to target here, I would get an additional die for that, so I'm up to five dice at this point. Well, I hope you found the video helpful in learning how to play Zombicide Undead or Alive. If you have any questions or comments, please post those in the comment section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Also, at the end of the video, I'll have a couple of links to playthrough videos I did for the game. So if you want to see some additional examples of how the game plays, check out one of those videos as well. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to watch my videos and leave me feedback on them. I do really appreciate it and take into account everything you say to make the best possible videos. Please also consider hitting that like button and sharing the video if you found it useful, as it really does help the channel out quite a bit. So until next time, I'll see you later.